Hello, everyone. My name is Florence Marr, and I am the organizer of this event on behalf of the Rotary Peace Fellowship Alumni Association. Uh, the Rotary Peace Fellowship Alumni Association is a group of Rotary Peace Fellow alumni and supporters from all across the world. And we are so happy to have you with us today uh, to hear uh, voices from across Oceania discussing experiences of climate change. So this event is anticipated to be 90 minutes. So first, uh, we will have some opening remarks from our partner at UNITAR. Then we will hear from our four featured speakers from across Oceania. Uh, and then we will go into breakout sessions. So in the breakout session, you'll be randomly put into a group with one of the speakers and you'll have 20 minutes to have a more intimate, uh, free flowing conversation uh, with the speakers. We have several volunteers on the call who will help guide those discussions. So when you go into the breakout room, the, the discussion uh, volunteer will, will help you give, get some instructions to guide those. Um, if you have any questions, you can write in the chat box to our Zoom host, uh, look for Rotary Peace Fellows Alumni Association. And I also want to note that we are recording this event and broadcasting it live on Facebook. However, the breakout sessions will not be recorded and will not be broadcast. I wanna thank uh, the partners who've helped make this event possible. Thank you to UNITAR, to the Red Dot Foundation, the Australian Lutheran World Service, and the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Papua New Guinea. And also thank you to our many volunteers uh, across the world who have um, dedicated several hours to organizing this event. And mostly thank you to our speakers who you're gonna hear more about from our moderator very soon. Uh, for donating time and energy to be with us here on a Saturday. Many of them have traveled or made sacrifices to be available online for this event. So now I want to introduce our partner, Junko Shimazu from UNITAR, who's going to give brief opening remarks. And then we will turn it over to our moderator, Yungnichka, to introduce our featured speakers. Junko, over to you. Hey, thank you very much. Do you uh, hear me okay? Okay, yeah. um, good afternoon yes. and, and greetings from Hiroshima, Japan. It is a pleasure to be here today. I'm Junko Shimazu, training associate of the Unidao Hiroshima office. Um, today, October 24th is known as the International Day of Climate Action and also uh, the United Nations Day and I'm very honored to be able to participate and speak at this wonderful event bearing witness of climate change, Voices from the Pacific. I would like to start by expressing my respect uh, to the initiatives taken by the Rotary Peace Fellowship Alumni Association. The Rotary Peace Fellowship Asso Alumni Association is very active in organizing various events and its thematic areas widely ranges from global cyber peace conference to peace events featuring atomic bomb survivors in Japan. All these topics are critical in bringing changes and peace to the future. I also believe that in this rapidly changing world, the initiatives led by you young volunteers, such as the Rotary Peace Fellowship Alumni Association, will be more and more important to respond quickly uh, to the trend and needs of the world. And each and every one of these initiatives are making a great difference globally. UNIDAL has been carrying out the tsunami-based disaster risk reduction training program, focusing on women, women's empowerment and a social inclusion in the Pacific region since 2016. So far, 123 women completed our training program, and I'm very excited to announce the fifth cycle is about to start in two weeks, inviting 100 women online. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said on the International Day of Disaster Risk Reduction of 
13th, October 2017, the poor and most vulnerable, including women and girls, suffer disproportionately in disasters. It will be a key to enhance the resilience of community and society by supporting vulnerable people, not only just as a care receivers, but by providing them knowledge to support themselves and other community members in case of emergency. We need to do much more than to understand the vulnerability, but also the capacity uh, of the people in the community across the Pacific and the Oceanian region. The ability to understand better the experience, uh, expertise, and wisdom of these people around the Pacific and Oce Oceania will be a big step forward to fight against climate change and to build resilience against natural and biological hazards together. In that sense, this event will be a great opportunity to hear the direct voices from the Pacific. I know we have outstanding speakers from the Pacific and Oceanian region today and eager to hear from them about their experience and expertise. I'm confident today's session will provide new findings that will benefit everyone participating today. Again, I would like to acknowledge the readership of the Rotary Peace Fellowship Alumni Association, which truly strengthen the interconnectedness in a humanity and UNITAL Hiroshima office fully support this initiative. Let's continue to push forward and work together to make this world a better place. Thank you very much today. Thank you, Yunko san um, My name is Jung Nitschke. I'll be moderating the session um, and introducing the speakers. But before I begin, I'll invite Elsa Marie, who is a, a fellow, a Rotary Peace Fellow and a, um, a founding board member of the Rotary Peace Fellowship to, to show us um, and speak about the results from our poll. Thanks, Jung. So it's really interesting to see who's with us today. And uh, we have about 10% who are Rotarians, uh, but the majority are people who are not Rotarians or Rotary Peace Fellows. So welcome everyone to our event. And uh, most people are curious, so that's great. So happy, excited, and curious is the, uh, you know, the mood in the room today. And a lot of people are here to learn and also um, you know, they recognize that they may not be an expert, but know enough to make lifestyle changes. So we are very excited because this is a very important conversation. And hopefully the testimonies from our speakers will encourage us to be greater advocates of climate change. And what's even more exciting is that 64% of people are here for the first time at an RPFA event. So welcome everyone. We regularly host these results and um, you know, keep a lookout for more. Thank you. Over to you, Jung. Thank you, Elsa. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Jung Nitschke. I'm a Rotary Peace Fellow and currently I reside in South Australia. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker um, who has traveled with his team for a long way from um, the Southern Highlands of Papua New Guinea to Ley, um, which is the location where he's streaming and joining us from today. So Reverend Tande Tombo is a pastor and a district president of the Emmanuel District of the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Papua New Guinea. He has served the church as a pastor for 31 years after graduating from the seminary in 1989. Before his call to serve in the church, he worked as a Bible translator for Summer Linguistic Institute in Papua New Guinea. Please welcome Reverend Hende. Fortunately, I think we have some um, internet connection issues with PNG. So in the meantime, I'll see if Florence is able to share the screen with everyone. Um, yeah, can you see my, the screen is sharing for the PowerPoint? Is this displaying correctly? You should see a map of Papua New Guinea. 
Can you open it to full screen? We can see your whole desktop. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I will see. Can you see the screen now? Yes, excellent. Oh, wonderful. I will go through the slides um, silently because I, I don't have the, and then uh, we can uh, see if Reverend Tande is able to join us. Hi everyone, sorry, we just had a blackout, so it kind of affected our internet connection. So we're just coming back. So Reverend Tane will con continue with this uh, presentation. Thank you. Please continue when you're ready, Reverend Tande. Hello. Sorry, yes, we our apologies. We were just off, uh, off by our power system here. I think that's a, another disaster here. <laughs> okay, so uh, we, we, we set up our committee in place to how we can manage and to restore ourselves. So we were partner with uh, our headquarters here in Papua New Guinea, which is Lutheran Church, and all our partners uh, as uh, Salvation Army and some other more. Okay, so there, uh, we we were uh, planning to we made a mapping and from there uh, we need we we plan to um, we we made our mapping here okay uh, from there uh, we were uh, to to identify all our we were affected so um, we plan to uh, food food. Uh, seed, seed bank and food, that's our priority. So we need to make a water. Also our waters were been affected and it was um, by disaster, earthquake. So we make water well here and then that's a project It's going on. We need to train our, our people in our villages. We can build our own water well to drink water from the well. Okay, then uh, we need to build our houses. So you know, we have, uh, we need to uh, partner with uh, the people. With, here you can see uh, uh, education, we, we, we partner with education department in our province, in our country to build a classroom here. So we, and also, uh, to build some clinics. Okay, then we uh, train people to how they can plant their own rice and potatoes and barbed onions. So you can see we are training people to, to take ownership and participate in to produce their own food and help uh, share with others. Um, what is the yeah, yeah. So th that's a project which is going on. So it's a live wood a project. So we are trying to um, steer our and our knowledge and to to uh, that you can see when we cut three, uh, we need to plant another three again. So. Okay, you can see here, uh, that's our closing part uh, for people participating in all trainings, uh, coming together to close up our project. Okay. Within this time, uh, there were, uh, in our implementation program, uh, there's all total of, uh, so far within two years, we have trained and then say our experience uh, 353, uh, including men, women, and everybody participate to say our experience and then to build our community again. So, so far we have 353 participants. Yeah, that, that's a map of 
project, you can see, uh, project site. John, is that, do we have enough time to continue or? Mary, we've got um, time for one last point and we can continue the conversation in the breakout rooms with Reverend Tende and his team. Okay, just uh, just go back to the next next uh, next um, go back go back to the next uh, the previous slide. Okay, Reverend Tane will just discuss that one and then finish. No, come back come back again. The other slide, that one. Okay. Okay. Uh, the, you know, we want partnership to share some of our experience and our knowledge and the resources we have. We need to share uh, with. So yeah. So we partner with our education department in our country and also with our... Sorry, go back to the previous slide, the previous one, that one, mm -hmm. thanks. So in our, in our partnership, we, we focus on the community benefit, which is education uh, to, and then also health services. That's our priority where everybody can benefit. And then the second priority we put in the house of family home and the church and others. So we have three Lucas mill, which is a sawmill to cut timber. So to support, to build, rebuild uh, houses and schools and clinics and, and, and others. I think that's all. And then thank you so much. Thank you, Reverend Tende. We'll um, be able to continue the discussion with you um, in our small breakout groups. Um, I would like to introduce our second speaker, uh, Mr. Tatawe Pezi, who currently resides in New Zealand, but um, is um, born, was born and bred on Tuvalu's capital atoll of Funafuti. He is a teacher and a disaster management specialist and a former secretary general of the Tuvalu Red Cross Society. He has a background in disaster response and climate change awareness and adaptation. Thank you, Mr. Tatawa. We would uh, love to hear more from you. Good evening uh, from Aotearoa and Dalofa. Um, um, thank you for the opportunity. I think I will uh, acknowledge the uh, uh, my appreciation for Rotary Peace Fellowship for the opportunity, and uh, uh, Mr. Tom uh, Tom for introducing me and inviting me to be part of this uh, um, Zoom uh, presentation. And, and I'm very happy to share my story and my experience of the climate change in Tuvalu. As I uh, mentioned in my um, introduction of my, uh, myself, um, I was a teacher and I have worked uh, as a climate change officer for the Tuvalu Red Cross and have worked nationally, na nationally um, which on all the islands, uh, which the, 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 that opportunity allowed me to reach the, oh, the whole islands of Tuvalu and work with the community and hear their stories and also um, work together with them uh, in adaptation projects uh, and how to uh, bring up their level of res resiliency uh, in, to compact, uh, to combat uh, the impact of climate change, which they are, are experiencing every day. Um, <clears throat> the, as, as you have known that Tuvalu is a, um, I'm sorry, I don't have a presentation. It would be better to have a presentation to show you uh, the uh, photo footage and, so, uh, and, um, and photos of Tuvalu, but I didn't prepare one. But uh, <clears throat> as you know, probably some people doesn't know uh, that Tuvalu uh, is a low-lying atoll like Kiribati and some other uh, atolls, uh, a very small and very um, 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 at high risk. And so <clears throat> the main issue in Tuvalu is the sea level rise, which is affecting the coastal uh, coast of all the islands. Um, Cyclones are the, the, the most frequent um, um, uh, problems that are affecting us. Um, droughts and uh, <clears throat> and all other sources uh, problems that are associated with these issues that we have highlighted. So with uh, with the issue of um, cyclones, you know, being 
I am now in my late 40s. Uh, so I came to New Zealand in 2014. So I, I haven't been here for five years. I haven't been back. But all those times, I truly experience and see the different changes uh, in Tuvalu. And um, yeah, there are evidence, uh, solid evidence that can be shared. Um, and, and I have, which I have shared as well uh, in the meetings that I have attended in the past well, when I was with the Red Cross. I was part of the, I was a uh, founding member of the Tuvalu Climate Action Network, uh, which I, I know some of the presenters uh, tonight are part of that as well, which I, I'm not sure I have met them, but I, I know them through correspondence. Um, uh, Pelinice Alpha from Kiribas, and uh, <clears throat> which we have worked a lot um, with the Tuvalu uh, Climate and Action Network, um, with the other NGOs in Tuvalu in, in trying to uh, coordinate the different projects. Uh, and, and so with cyclones, um, yeah, um, that was one thing that um, um, I, I, I can't um, tell you the, the difference. Um, like we always have a cyclone season, uh, which when I was young, we celebrate um, uh, Christmas always wet because that's the season uh, from October until February or March. That is always, but mainly during Christmas time, that is always the heavy rainfall time. It's always wet. As I grew up, I became a man and, uh, and then now it's not happening that way at all. It, it can be uh, <clears throat> heavily raining during the whole and a cyclone comes in the middle of the year. You know, before cyclones usually just happen during Christmas time, that is the time where we always prepare uh, ourselves and in our young boys will go as young boys will go house to house to help um, put up put up uh, cyclone shelters, uh, traditional cyclone shelters for each house, our neighbors uh, in those in those times. Now we hardly do that because, you know, it can happen any time uh, during the year. Uh, it's, sometimes it's, it's just not uh, <clears throat> uh, unpredictable. It can happen at any, any time. And the same with uh, droughts. Um, yeah, well, with cyclones, I, I, the, one of the changes that I see it's getting severe, intensive. Um, since uh, Hurricane Baby in uh, uh, 1972, I was not born yet, but my mom was one of the survivors, uh, which she, um, she got a, a medal for, for um, rescuing a, 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 a girl and a mother from during that time. So I have a lot of stories about it. And, uh, you know, I could just only tell how um, uh, dangerous it was uh, then. Um, but since the time when I was growing up in Tuvalu, we always have cyclones, but it hasn't got to that uh, severity as the cyclone, as what I have seen, uh, I heard from uh, about the cyclone baby. But in 2015, while I was here in New Zealand, Cyclone Pam struck in Tuvalu. And just seeing the videos, uh, which uh, uh, it affected most of the islands in Tuvalu, and some of the islands were very badly affected. During, during the Cyclone BB in 1972, um, <clears throat> most of the, I think the most of the devastated islands was Funafuti. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, and uh, yeah, Funafuti was the worst one. But uh, for Cyclone Pam, I think 2015, or 16, I can't remember, but yeah, it, it really worried me actually, um, honestly, um, looking at the footage and seeing what has actually happened to those islands, even like the graveyards has been eroded into the sea. Um, uh, it was really sad. Um, and, and that is how, the, how, how severe it is now. Um, with the drought, the drought, there hasn't, uh, and since Hurricane uh, you know, 1972, Hurricane Bibi, there, there was international help. I think the, 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 there was other international help as well along the way, but not that, as big as what was in 2011 when we had a drought. And I, I think that was our first drought international um, request uh, for um, international intervention. Uh, I was coordinating the the two other Red Cross um, drought response. Um, and we had a lot of help uh, from the Australian Red Cross, the International Federation of uh, Federation of Red Cross and some other, other NGOs. 
Uh, and yeah, we were, I, I could just um, um, tell how bad it is. And being out to some of the outer islands who have uh, um, asked for requests and we went there and do our, our, our assessments. And, you know, I was I'm very thankful to the response from the international community um, into in helping the Toronto Red Cross and the National Disaster Management Office and, and other all, all the, uh, the, the National Disaster Management um, Committee in their response and during that time. It was a good experience. And, uh, yeah, a lot of projects came out of it, um, especially in water, uh, which, yeah, of course, and also like uh, traditional knowledge was one of the things that was highlighted when we need to, uh, we have to work on it because a lot of uh, tradi there's just traditional knowledge is always there, already there. And so they just need to be brought out again and then shared to the young generations so that they can know and um, make use of it, uh, document it well. Um, yeah, and uh, <clears throat> uh, there are capacities that are already there like in water systems that need to be um, uh, restored, um, renovated, um, yeah, and anything else. Yeah, so <clears throat> it that was a, a bad one, the drought uh, in 2011. Um, <clears throat> another thing, um, uh, yeah, a long-term uh, <clears throat> uh, problem is the uh, what in uh, salt water intrusion. That is one of the things that is really, really affected my home island. That is where I am from, uh, the, the capital of Tuvalu, Funavuti. Um, as you all know, that Tuvalu, Funavuti is 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 like a boomerang, um, <clears throat> very low. At the highest um, point is about two meter, two to three meter. Uh, the highest point, uh, yeah, four, two to four meter. Uh, but you know, you don't build on those on those points because you you build just one meter above. So the actual uh, uh, landing where people are, are built is about just over a meter. So <clears throat> uh, the land uh, underground water is uh, is not is not good. So that that was the severity of the um, of the drought in Tuvalu, and so we have to use uh, the what do you call um, salt salt water. And you have desalinators. Yeah, we have to bring in desalinators to to assist in our uh, with that. And there were a lot of projects that came in, on uh, building more water tanks and uh, and also uh, changing the um, the way to build houses because of the land uh, issue because it's so small. You know, Tuvalu, uh, uh, yeah, it's very small. <clears throat> so yeah, because of the land issue, you know, people have to build houses uh, with the water system underground, and then you build a house on top. Because you know, if you have to put water tanks around that, it will take up the spaces. Um, <clears throat> and lastly, I think one of the main thing that I I had I got or I experienced uh, in in the discussions and always a mention in the in the international community during our conferences and uh, uh, and meetings that we attended is the <clears throat> we the, the those the international community always referred. Uh, as small uh, the Pacific Islands as small islands and other small islands as well small islands <clears throat> the thing I want to highlight here is the difference between the small islands which they they always use I want to highlight how small and vulnerable Tuvalu is compared to other to other countries <clears throat> the smallest of Tuvalu the smallness of Tuvalu makes it more at risk and a person will only understand how small a country is if they go there and see for themselves. Because they can talk about small, they will compare Tonga to Tuvalu, they'll compare Tonga, um, Fiji to Tuvalu, but Tuvalu is nowhere near the, to the, the size, in size to those countries. So they all group as small islands, but Tuvalu is very, very vulnerable in terms of our national uh, geography setup and size. So that is the one thing that I want to leave you uh, with about Tuvalu, uh, how small it is and the level of, of vulnerability in comparison to other Pacific uh, um, countries. Um, I hope my presentation uh, <laughs> is of um, use and um, interest to all of you. And if you have any further question, I am happy to answer them during the discussions. Thank you very much for the opportunity.
Thank you, Mr. Tatawa. That was um, very insightful and a personal account of um, the situation in Tuvalu. And um, I would like to move to another very small island state in the Pacific, um, to the King um, to Kiribati. So I would like to invite um, Miss Pelanese Alofa uh, from Kiribati, who is the national coordinator for the Kiribati Climate Action Network, which is an umbrella NGO in Kiribati. Uh, Ms. Pelanese is an active advocate for stopping climate change internationally and in the Pacific region. She is a teacher by profession and her involvement in education has led to her working with youth and students on climate change programs. Her objective in life is to fully utilise her skills and knowledge to help alleviate poverty and improve the quality of life for the people of Kiribati and more broadly in the Pacific, particularly in the face of climate change. So welcome Pelanese. Mallory, can you hear me? Loud and clear, Pelanice. Thank you. Well, I bring you greetings from Kiribati. And you want to know where Kiribati is? We're just above Tuvalu. Very close to the equator and um, it's right in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It is small, tiny, we, you may not be able to see the, see the islands, they're just dots on the map, but there are some very unique um, features about Kiribati. And you may like to take your time and do a research on this. One is, it's the only country in the world that falls into four hemispheres of the world. It's in the north, the south hemisphere, then east and the west. Why? Because Kiribati has the biggest ocean in the world. So it lies from the east to the west. Uh, you just put it across America, almost cover the east to the west of America. That's the size of Kiribati Ocean. It's also, it also has the biggest atoll island in the world. It's not an island like Papua New Guinea, the biggest island in the world, but it is the biggest atoll island. Our biggest atoll island is Christmas or Christmas Island, just south of Hawaii. It also has the international deadline that cut across. And uh, so we have an island called the Millennium Island. And so that's a little bit of uh, introduction to um, Kiribati. And I, I guess the last one that is that makes uh, Kiribati unique today is that it is still very authentic. When I say it's authentic, it, they live in their culture and they live in they live in their culture and still um, haven't changed much. If you go to outer islands, people are living in their traditional huts and um, continues to live that way and enjoy life peacefully. And um, we are part of the Micronesian Islands or in the Pacific. And I think of all Micronesian Islands, I think Kiribati is still very authentic, like traditionally, they live in their traditional way of uh, lifestyle. Um, so I do not have a presentation to um, share with you, but I'll talk about my experiences as a, as a community worker on climate change to my people. And um, I always share three words with them. And that is te maori te roi te tabomo. It's uh, three words that are part of the emblem of our government. Te maori te roi te tabomo, which means uh, good health, peace, and prosperity. Those three words are so important to Ikiribas. You never change places of, in those three words. You never put prosperity first. 
or peace first, you always start with the word memory. And we, I talk about these three words when I talk about climate change, because so many of us today, our youth, they do, we talk about the memory right the Bomo, but we do not understand. And so when we have problems like climate change, we do not know how to tackle them because we thought that money or prosperity come first. So in the Kiribati um, um, culture, like, uh, like when the Maori, the Maori is what your protection, protection as a Kiribati, your protection, that means your culture, your traditions, your skills, what you're taught at home, those are your protection that gives you good health. And if you are 100% or maybe 90% or you're strong with that values of the Ikiribas values, then you step out of your home and you bring peace, the Maori, to your communities. And when your communities of Kiribas is, um, have peace, then that's when we achieve prosperity. So, with these three words, I want to start my conversation with you, like our work with climate change. We want to end the poverty. At the same time, we want to stop the climate change. So how can we actually really tackle the problem of climate change? Do we start with the Maori or we, do we start with the peace? Or we do, do we start or we approach this problem with prosperity? Well, for us, we realize that we always go back to our traditional values. What is there? What is the memory in us that we can share to the world so that we can have peace? And one of the things that we've done in Kiribati, we've set up the PIPA, the Pacific, or oh, um, what you call the Phoenix Islands protect, Protectorate Area. That means it's our ocean conservation, our marine conservation. That's our gift, the Maori. It's not about money. We're actually giving a gift to the world. But what is the world giving, you know, to stop the climate change for the people of Kiribati? We realize we cannot keep on asking. We also need to give. And so we've given part of our oceans and it was a controversy. Many people said, if we give it away, then it will reduce a fish catch in Kiribati and we won't make enough money. Because that ocean, that ocean space is so big that we've given away and conserved and um, as a protected area, but after a few years, you know, today we are making more fish and we are making more from our fisheries. We used to have like just 50 million or 100 million per, per annum from fish. And that's our main income for Kiribati. But today we did it, we gave away the marine for, for climate change. But today we're getting more than 200 million per annum from the fish. Even though, you know, we have a marine conservation protected. So in both ways, they are good. Mm -hmm. The protected area is actually feeding and providing fish for the whole world. Because when the fish breeds in Kiribati and they move, they don't just stay in Kiribati, they move to other countries. Moving to Papua New Guinea, moving to Tuvalu, the Solomons, north of Micronesia. So... That's part of what I call the Maori, you know, your values and what you have to tackle your climate change. It's not just about asking for adaptation fund. We need to give, and all of us, we need to give, even Pacific Island countries. We need, that will bring us peace and we eventually we get prosperity. Um, Tuvalu has mentioned the problems that we they have. I won't repeat on that because it's exactly the same with us. We have king tides 
And when cyclones come around in the Pacific, it reaches us. We've never had cyclones before in Kiribati. Tuvalu has had, not Kiribati, but today we are having the impacts of cyclones that happen around the Pacific Ocean. We actually, what we call it, the, the rhythms or what happened in the, in, in the other countries like Fiji, uh, the Solomons and Vanuatu, the ripples of their cyclone, like a wave, the ripples come to us. But the ripples supposed to be there, it's just a tiny thing, but for Tuvalu, which is very low, it's huge to us. You know, it come over the islands. And so we have all those, but the question is, what are we doing, you know, as solutions? For Kiribati Climate Action Network, we've decided with our partner, uh, Live and Learn Environmental Education, we share the office here in Kiribati. We've decided we're going to build, or we're going to start a place called a resilient village. And we've, it only came about because there was a place here in Tarawa. Tarawa has more than 50,000, half the population of Kiribati is based here in Tarawa. Then we have this place that have water. You know, when the king tide came, it just came over this place. It's a hotel where I'm sitting right now. It used to be the first private hotel. And it just, water just came through and everyone left this place and this hotel was closed. And last year, in February last year, when water came back again to this place, we actually came and requested the owner and asked the owner, can we come and use that place? And everyone think that we are stupid, why? And we said, because we are climate change people. We will stop the problem. We will look for the solution to bring that space, place back into a, a place that you can live on. And we have a theme that we are not drowning, we are fighting. So what's the point of us running away from this place when the water comes in? So the way to fight is to stop this water coming in. So we, we came in here last year, we we start building seawalls, strengthen the seawalls, doing land, landfills. And now we are, we are working on projects like water projects and planting the old place. And just last week, more water came in and we're going to do some more adaptation. So what we, I guess for all of us in the Pacific, we do have problems with climate change, but the, the solution is in our hands. We turn around and run, or we stand and face the problem. In Kiribati, creating the resilient village here right now to stop, the, stop this problem is actually telling the world that we can stay in Kiribati. We don't have to move. And the owner of this place has just so happy and has given us this place, say, please do what you can do to make, make sure that it, we can live on it again in the next maybe 10 years, we can come back to that land and live on it. So this is where we live. We still, it's still, we're still trying to adapt in this office, but it's our resilient village. And we're going to bring in all the different uh, projects on this land, the energy project, the water, the planting of food and, and uh, resilience. So, uh, we have some people that are willing to donate and to build a floating garden, a floating maneba. Maneba is a hall, meeting halls, but we need to create something for people to understand that we can survive, that we can adapt. Our houses have, they have to see a construction that is adaptation construction, you know, and not today people are still building on the ground. I say, why? We shouldn't. Everybody should be above the ground. So that's, um, some of the work that we're doing right now, building the, the resilient villages and restructuring all our community-based organizations on Tarawa. You know, we used to work with 100. We thought it's many. But today, this year, we restructure all the community-based groups and we found that we, there are 700 communities on Tarawa. So, 
And so that's um, the work that we were doing right now. For the time being, we are busy with working with um, the COVID, climate change and COVID on Tarawa, trying to work with uh, 700 communities. We are almost over, finish. When we do the restructuring, it's easy to do the work. Yeah, so that's what I can share with us right now. Uh, we do have problems, but we, I really, we feel that the solutions is in our hands. We can choose to adapt or we choose to leave. And uh, for us in Kiribati, our government say, the previous government say, we can migrate with dignity. Today, if you ask any Ikiribas, you want to migrate? Oh yes, we want to move. You want to move for good? No, we want to move and come back. This is our home. We, we, want, we always want to come back to Kiribati. Without Kiribati, then we are. You know, what, what do we say about ourselves? How can we identify ourselves in a foreign country? So that's what we're doing right now. We're not just doing for our Kiribati, here, we are doing it for our Ikiribas, our diaspora outside of Kiribas, who are living in New Zealand, in Australia. Without these tiny, small, uh, vulnerable islands, they will have nothing, you know? They will lose their identity. That's why we are here, keeping it for them, to make sure they will return home. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. For your um, inspiring remarks um, and reminding us that um, of your resilience and your passion for um, climate action. We might have enough time for our final speaker, um, Paisi Tai, who is from the Kingdom of Tonga. Um, Paisi was born and grew up in the Kingdom of Tonga. She works for the mainstreaming of rural development innovation Tonga Trust as a disaster response coordinator. In this role, she is assisting the team by implementing activities to enhance community capacity and improve their resilience towards the impacts of climate change. So, Pessy, if you can hear us, um, perhaps you, we could try and um, and if you could um, address us live. If not, then we can go to the audio recording. Pessy, can you hear us? Pessy is on mute. Pacey, you're on mute. So perhaps um, Pacey has been having a little bit of internet connection issue. So Pacey, can you hear us? So perhaps um, if we could share Pacey, Pacey has recorded um, a recording for us in case there were any internet connections. So perhaps if we could share that, Florence or Elsa. Yes. I have the recording. So we will listen to the pre recorded message from. Oh, Pessy, are, are you able to connect or should I start playing the recording? Okay, I'm going to start playing the recording then. Dear distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure uh, to share with you how Tonga impact by your screen. In general, there are many problems that climate change causes for Tonga, such as drought, extreme weather patterns, Florence, we can't see your screen, Florence. Sorry? We can't see your screen. Uh, there's no video. It's, it's an audio only recording. Okay. Or do we have Tessie on the line? Maybe you want to start again, please. Okay. I'd be happy to start the recording again. So this is an audio only recording from Pessy. <laughs> Okay, I will start the recording once again. Thank you everyone for your patience. So again, this is a recording sent in advance for PESI. 
Dear distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure to share with you how drones are impacted by the climate change. In general, there are many problems that climate change causes for Tonga, such as drought, extreme weather patterns, rising sea levels, and dying coral reefs. You may have heard about Tropical Cyclone Kita, a storm which hit Tonga in early 2018. Tropical Cyclone Kita was a massive Category 4 cyclone that was the largest storm to hit Tonga in the previous years. It caused massive damage, especially to Tonga Tapu, but also one of our islands called Ewa. Storms like Kita are becoming more and more common as the climate warms. Just this year, Tropical Cyclone Herod Category 5 storm hit Donga and again devastated both Donga Tapu and Ewa Island. While we are doing everything, we can prepare for intense weather burdens in the future. It is clear that not only a large Cyclones occurring more frequently, they are becoming even more severe. Thankfully, Cyclone Kita hit Tonga just as we were experiencing a low tide, so flooding was as minimal as possible under the circumstances. Unfortunately, Cyclone Herod did not hit during low tide, and flooding causes caused significant damage especially to the only wharf in Ewa. The second issue caused by climate change in Tonga is that most of the islands that make up Tonga are only a few meters above sea level. Because of this, rising sea levels are a serious concern. Should another large cyclone hit Tonga, a likely possibility at high tide instead of low, the damage cause would be exponentially higher. There is also the basic consideration that after just a few decades of rising sea levels, much of Tonga could be underwater. This is a major problem in a country that relies so heavily on agriculture and is already in desperate need of arable land. Another component of the damage climate change causes to the countries like Tonga is the accelerating rate of the thefts of coral reef. Tonga is highly dependent on fishing, both commercially and subsistence. As the oceans become increasingly warmer and more acidic, reef like the ones surrounding all Tonga islands die out. This in turn kills fish and plants that live in the reefs. The damage this would cause directly to the Tongan fishing industry, but also indirectly to the proto-Tongan ecosystem is effectively incalculable. All these issues are not only serious concern that could jeopardize the kingdom of Tonga, they are immediate pressing concerns that need to be dealt with now. Storms continue to get more powerful, sea levels continue to rise, and coral reefs continue to die every minute that we sit and discuss climate change without taking action. We face a tremendous challenge. Not only do we need to find solution to the problem of climate change, we need the entire world to join and make a better world for all of us. Tonga is a small country, we could reach a net carbon emissions of zero tomorrow, and it would change nothing in the face of global momentum behind climate change. But Tonga does not have the luxury of debating the existence of climate change, or whether it is fair to force countries to pursue sustainable energy solution. We need a global coalition of countries across the spectrum of size and economic development committees to immediate action if small Pacific island nations like Doma are to survive. Thank you. Okay, Pacey, is, um, are you there? Can you hear us? Ladies and gentlemen, it is with great <laughs> Thanks, Florence. Um, 
I can see Pacey's still on the line, but she's on mute. So perhaps if we could um, move on to the breakout rooms and we might have an opportunity to, to ask questions of Pacey a little bit later or within the breakout rooms. So Florence, can I get you to organize that please? So I've opened up the breakout rooms and you should be able to um, go automatically, but if you're joining in from your phone, just move one screen and click on the button.